Good morning, Woodstock. Good morning. Welcome to everyone. I'm glad you're here today. It's wonderful to see everybody. Welcome to friends. Welcome to family. Welcome to visitors. Welcome to members. Looking forward to a great worship service today. A few announcements before we get started. Uh, everybody remind, uh, remind ourselves, I'm sorry. Let me remind you. Let me remind you that uh, tonight starts our VBS for the week. We're going to have a wonderful time with the children downstairs. There are a couple of things to remember about the VBS. One, it starts downstairs this evening at 7 p.m., but immediately following the service this morning, we ask that anybody that's participating in the VBS uh, as, a, as an aide, oh, what's that? Can somebody turn off your cell phone? I set myself a reminder to remind you. Let's all take the moment to turn our cell phones off or silent. <laughs> it, I hate it when people interrupt me. No, uh, take, a, take a second just to do that because we don't want the interruptions in the worship service today. But we are going to have a meeting for those that are uh, involved in the organization and participation of the VBS. Immediately following services in room 206 for a few minutes, Lincoln asked that we uh, get some news and information from him. Uh, also, we have an attended nursery. If you have some small ones and need time to go cry or change a diaper, as, as me and my wife find ourselves in that situation often with our little ones, down on the, the far left, there's a, a few rooms down there to take care of whatever you might need. Feel free to take, take advantage of that. Uh, we also have some news regarding um, the India missions. If you look at the bulletin, there's a lot of news I'm not going to go over, but one item that I thought was of a particular interest is that we've met our financial goals to be able to provide services and uh, support for the India missions this year. So praise God for that. Thank you all for your efforts in, in making that goal get met. Uh, Camp in the Gate, he begins next Sunday. For those that are registered and involved in that, I'm sure you haven't forgotten that, but I want to make sure everybody else knows about that. VBS tonight, and this morning we're going to have a little bit of a different worship order tonight, so we're doing that just to keep you on your toes. But I'm going to immediately hand over the services as we begin this morning. Uh, let's keep in mind what Psalms 102.22 says, which is that when we all gather together, we come together to worship the Lord in unison. So no schisms, no diversion. Everybody, let's turn our hearts towards prayer this morning as we open in prayer with Brother Brandon leading us. Thank you. Let's bow as we begin to worship. Lord, thank you for allowing us to gather today. Thank you for this morning that, we've, that we have to, uh, to worship you. Lord, I pray that everything we do today helps us give, have more hope for the future, strengthens our faith in you and our love for you and for your people. Lord, be with us now. Help direct our minds and our hearts towards you and all that, that has happened for, uh, that you've done for us. Thank you for your son. In his name we pray. Amen. It's time for us now to uh, remember what our Lord did for us at Calvary. We're going to be partaking of the elements that are contained within this little cup. If you do not have one of those, raise your hand and we'll get one to you immediately. In that container, over here please. In that container, we have two elements. We have unleavened bread, which represents his pure but broken body. And we have the fruit of the vine, which represents the blood that was shed that we might be set free from sin. He has asked us to, each one of us who are Christians, to partake of those elements on the first day of every week. 
And we want to do that now according to the New Testament pattern that we find in Matthew chapter 26. So if you would turn that over, take the lid off and take that unleavened bread out of that cup, we will be saying a prayer as he did in Matthew 26. If you have that, let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for Jesus. We thank you for the love that sent him here and the love that he demonstrated that day when that pure but broken body was nailed to the cross tree of Calvary. We thank you for it, dear God, and we pray that as we partake of it, our mind will be totally focused upon that event that we might be pleasing to you and to him. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Let's all partake of that together. Having done that, turn that little container over and the fruit of the vine will be in there which represents his shed blood. And we'll give thanks for that before we partake. Would you bow again, please? Father, we thank you for the blood of Christ. We thank you that it cleanses us from our sin. And Father, we pray for its application to our lives even at this hour, that we might stand before you justified, especially on that day when we'll stand before you. We thank you for it, dear God, in Christ's holy name. Amen. Having done that, we now want to turn to another item of worship, which is the giving of our means on the first day of every week, as he has directed that we do. And I would suppose that most of us have already done that, but we want to give uh, God the glory for it and the thanks uh, to him for the physical blessings that he has given us and for the opportunity that we now have to remember all of that and thank him for it. Would you bow again, please? Father, we thank you so much for every physical blessing in addition to those spiritual blessings. We thank you, dear God, that there has been a collection taken. We thank you for that, and we pray that our elders will distribute that as best uh, fits the circumstances that would be in accordance with your will. We ask that in Christ's name. Amen. Morning. Today's scripture reading comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verses 1 through 4. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. grateful for the presence of each and every one and as we go through our topics on the general idea of unity this year we we now are coming to uh, a very very important lesson and that has to do with God's whole plan of salvation I don't want us to confuse the two statements God's plan of salvation and what must I do to be saved do you know the difference? 
And I'm not going to be too hard on anybody that doesn't know the difference because this is not really preached this way. I believe growing up that I was taught that they were one and the same. Now, what must I do to be saved is included in God's plan of salvation, but that's not the totality of the plan. Most of the time when preachers finish their lesson, they offer an invitation. We sing an invitation song. And what we're dealing with there is not always God's whole plan of salvation. We're dealing with what must I do to be saved, which is a part of that plan. But rarely have I heard God's whole plan of salvation taught in a lesson, in one lesson. Probably because of time. So I'm going to do my best, even as we have kind of switched the order of worship today, to uh, have what I've called a singing sermon, where the points of the sermon are going to be sung. So with that in mind, I realize, to borrow a phrase of one of our songs, less of me and more of Jeremy. <laughs> Sorry. This lesson is the whole gospel plan of salvation. And when we think of that, we need to think of and some thoughts of liberalism notwithstanding that there is God's part, there is man's part or man as a sinner as he's coming to Christ, what must he do to be saved? And then as a saved Christian, what is that Christian's part? And guess what? This is God's 12-step plan for recovery. To borrow a phrase from AA. But there's actually 12 steps in God's plan of salvation. We say we give the five-step plan on what must I do to be saved. And that is very valid. And it's very true. And that should never change. But let's not confuse what must I do to be saved as if that's the most important thing. And it's not the most important thing or the foundational thing. Because if it wasn't for God's part, man's part would mean nothing. No matter how many times I was dunked in water. And maybe an understanding of this will lessen the idea that those of us in churches of Christ emphasize baptism, 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 baptism. Now, I believe that that is emphasized and maybe to a greater degree because the religious world de-emphasize it and really don't understand it. As per not have anything to do with salvation. But let's take away some of that castigation by making sure that we understand that God's part, which will include the first four points here, is the most foundational. And, and what happens to a house when you build a house? If there's a, a problem in the foundation, the whole house falls. Remember? Uh, the wise man that builds his house on a rock, on a, on a firm foundation, then the house has a greater likelihood of standing. And so it is with God's plan of salvation. The five-finger exercise was introduced into our fellowship by a restorer. His name was Walter Scott. And he would teach uh, children's classes many times. And he would, he would show them as far as what people needed to do to be saved. He would show them the, the hearing, believing, repenting, confessing, and being baptized. And he would encourage them, now you go home and you teach your parents this. And that was back in the middle 1800s. Again, a very valid concept. And I hope that when we put up a whole hand, we think of what must I do to be saved. But I hope that when we do that, we don't think that's the summation of God's plan of salvation. Quite a difference. Because you know, uh, in John chapter 3 and verse 16, if it wasn't for God's divine love, salvation, the plan of salvation would not work. 
not the 12-step plan of salvation or the five-step plan of what must I do to be saved. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I am glad that God's love is not dependent upon emotion. Can you think of how emotional the cross was? What do you think the father thought about what was happening to his only begotten son? Now, if emotions, and that's the problem with love defined today, it's basically built upon, well, what side of the bed did I get up on? What kind of mood am I in? I'm going to love my wife depending if I feel like it. And when people talk about love as a feeling, primarily, that's when marital problems happen. That's when problems in business relationships happen. That's what happens when congregations are not as unified because they're not understanding what love is. Love doesn't react because it offends me in an emotional way because God the Father was very emotional at the time of Christ, but he so loved us that he put emotion aside and he did what was best for us. Now, how deep is the Father's love? Keep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure that he should give his only Son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss. The Father turns his face away. But not only do we have God's divine love that is the most foundational step in God's plan of salvation, how can this second step be forgotten? Can anyone be saved without the Father's grace? For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. What not of yourselves? We cannot save ourselves. If it wasn't for the grace of the Father, based upon his love, salvation could not be possible. How could we exclude this from God's plan? In Titus chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared unto all men. All men can learn and receive the benefits of God's grace. But because it's appeared unto all men... All men will not accept its teaching because this grace teaches us that we deny ourselves just like the Lord did on the cross, teaching us the denying ungodliness and worldly lusts. You know, lusts, those things that we desire more than God. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. And if we do that, then that grace is certainly going to be amazing. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Was 
How could the plan of salvation be accomplished without Christ's blood? We have commemorated that death already this morning as we partook of the fruit of the vine that represents the crimson flow. When the Bible says that life is in the blood, that's not only true science, that is true from a spiritual standpoint. And without the blood of Christ applied to my life, and without that sacrifice, there can be no salvation. L let's, let's make this point here. We need to understand that salvation doesn't flow from anything I do. Repentance and baptism included. That's not the source of salvation. And when we teach others the gospel, I hope that we're converting them to more than baptism. We need to convert them to Christ. And then what must I do to be saved will naturally fall in order. There won't be a question if they're truly converted to Christ. That Christ and the whole God family had such divine love that it's unfathomable. That that grace was so great that we received at Christ's expense our redemption and then the blood that makes it all possible. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 9, much more than having now been justified, just if I'd never sinned, as I lay my sins at the feet of Jesus and he takes them away with his blood, which the blood of bulls and goats could not do under the law. What a greater law. What a greater cleansing we have. And in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5, and from Jesus Christ the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. <clears throat> Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? of God's part in man's salvation. It has been done. It has been completed. There is none, nothing else that we need to receive from God as it pertains to our becoming a Christian and having our sins washed away. Truly, Jesus paid it all at the cross. Does it mean that there's not a responsibility on man's part to access that and to come to Christ? But when it comes to God's part, the first four, generally speaking, I know there's some other particulars. For instance, mercy. But grace and mercy are kissing cousins. 
They're, they're so close there. We see the mercy that God has, has for us in his grace. But basically speaking, these four are integral and they are most foundational. And one must understand God's divine love, at least as far as it's revealed, and must understand the role of grace, and must understand what Christ's blood does and when it is applied, as we'll see in just a moment, and the fact that this fourth part in God's plan, how could salvation be had without the Holy Spirit's word? That is the trans... Uh, that, that, that's what goes from God to man. That's how he has communicated his great salvation. It's through the word of God and through no other. And that's why we always want to emphasize at this place, something is not true because we believe it. Something is not true because I said it. Something is not true because any man says it. It's true because we have the inspired word of God's Holy Spirit to allow us to understand the divine love that makes it all possible. <clears throat> Give me the Bible when my heart is broken, when sin and grief have filled my soul with fear. Give me the treasures for my Jesus so no way that salvation can be realized without God's part and our accepting of the Father and our accepting Christ and our accepting the Holy Spirit's word without which no man could even think about salvation. So you see the dilemma sometimes we have when we preach a lesson and we leave some of this out. And at the end of the lesson, every time we emphasize what must I do to be saved, sometimes that might lend itself to at least implying that if we're talking about the number of times it is said, that maybe we're emphasizing what must I do to be saved instead of what God has done to allow me to be saved, the foundation. If you think of this, uh, this outline, think of a pyramid. God's part is at the base, and we're working our way up. But here now, we start with the part of God's plan of salvation. What must man do to be saved? But don't ever forget what God has done. First, we have sinner's faith. In John chapter 8 and verse 24, Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins if you believe not that I am God. You will die in your sins. And in Acts chapter 16, do you remember the great example of conversion? He brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, speaking of the, uh, the jailer, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. 
Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all that were in his house. He took them the same hour of the night. The same hour of the night. There's a reason for that. We'll talk about it in a minute. And uh, washed their stripes. Immediately he and all his, uh, his family were baptized. Now when he had brought them into his house, he set food before them and he rejoiced. Now watch this. Having believed in God with all his house. Have you noticed that it wasn't said of the jailer in his household that he believed in God until after he was baptized? And that's of no little significance. When we think of the idea of belief and faith in Scripture, that faith, that belief always acts. If I believe in you, then I'm going to live my life as if I believed in you and not something I just say verbally. If I have faith in you, I am going to live my life to demonstrate that faith. And hopefully that will allow us to understand what James means when he talks about faith. But notice that this is not Christian's faith. This is the sinner as he's coming to God, as he realizes what God has done for him in the first part of our lesson. Then this faith is going to act in a very great way. So without faith being the victory, how in this world could salvation even be possible? And kept along the hills of mighty gracious over the and rest of that layer of the night shall bet the glowing signs of hands of glowing and bells below that all the changing world may give us a victory we know that overcomes the world. Let us never think that in God's plan of salvation, faith is the only step in God's 12-step plan for recovery. Because we say a man is saved by grace, let us not neglect what all the Scripture says about God's great plan of salvation. When John 3.16 says, believe in Jesus and you will be saved, let's not think at least that mental assent is the only thing necessary for God's, uh, for God's salvation to man. The whole 12-step plan is absolutely necessary. Without one step, salvation cannot be had. Whether it's on God's part or man's part. But as we continue man's part, and after the sinner comes in faith, then guess what he's led to do because of that faith? Then there's sinner's repentance. He's still a sinner. He's still coming to God. He hasn't married Jesus Christ. He hasn't been through the marriage ceremony yet. He's just dating Christ. He's getting to know Christ. His life and his mind is beginning to change. And that change culminates when he says, I am leaving the things of this life that do not correspond with God's word, no matter how much I emotionally like them. My love for God, my spirit is going to transcend what I feel, and I'm going to do just what God says. I am coming to God in a mind and in a life of repentance. In Acts chapter 17 and verse 30, truly these times of ignorance, what times of ignorance were those when God's completed revelation was not given to man? God was not overlooking sin. God never overlooked sin. 
But at those times when the full revelation is not revealed, there was some overlooking. He overlooked the times. He didn't overlook the sin. That is a major mistake that people make in, in, in translating and in, in determining this verse. But now, why does he now, at the time of this writing, commend and uh, he commands all men everywhere to repent? Here's the sunlight age. Because the revelation is coming in a fuller form. And because of that, Jesus then would say, when he was answering the question, you know, were the sinners the, and, and the people that perished at the, at, the, at the Tower of Siloam, and many died there, they were wanting to know, well, because they experienced that event, were they greater sinners than anybody else? And this is where I tell you nay, I tell you no. Usually we just quote this verse, but that's the context of why they're being told no. No, they weren't any greater sinners than anybody else, but I tell you, except you repent, you will all likewise perish. Now that's coming from a loving God who doesn't want anyone to go to hell. And that's why he gives this in his plan of salvation. And by the way, if there's anybody that needs to repent or even to be baptized right now, don't wait for the invitation song. Come now. Come now. We, we, we don't wait for this. We're talking about God's plan of salvation. If you know you need to repent, if you know that your love has been more emotional and more self-centered than based on the Word of God and accepting God and Christ as your Savior, accept Him now into your heart and come forward and, and repent of your sins. And we can baptize you right now. Repent. Changing the mind. Remember the prodigal son? He knew what the truth was. He wanted to live more emotionally. He went into the far city and, or the far country and he wasted his life. He wasted his substance. He wasted everything about his life. But then he thought he was repenting. He was changing his mind. Why am I living life like this? Don't I know that there is a pending judgment and I'm going to meet the one that loves me so? What can I do to change this? Well, we sing and we say and we do just what that prodigal said. Father, I'm coming home. I In all of man's part in coming to God, that is the hardest step. It's not the hardest step to understand and to have faith in Jesus Christ or even to be immersed in water. That's the most difficult. But once that is done, that is so meaningful and will get us in a mindset of what we do even throughout our Christian life. Repentance doesn't just happen before one becomes a Christian. If you're living the Christian life, you do that every day. You change your mind every day of what you're going to do to serve God better. But after sinner's repentance, guess what's next? And have you noticed in Scripture there's never the sinner's prayer? It's sinner's baptism. I want to be careful in calling this believer's baptism because my belief is not complete until I'm immersed in water. And that step, even we can argue, is it emphasized, de-emphasized, over-emphasized, whatever, is a necessary component in understanding that the blood of Christ is being applied there. And if one doesn't understand that when he's baptized, the baptism is not valid. 
There is a most important question that goes along with what must I do to be saved, and that what is what must I know to be saved. Am I knowing that I'm being baptized and I'm contacting the blood and the Lord is adding me to his body where unity is pronounced and where unity is encouraged and where unity in matters of faith is demanded and the religious world can't change those things? The blood of Christ is contacted when I am immersed in water. Uh... And when I am immersed in water, I realize that I am accepting Jesus as Lord. Now, many times that confession is made before uh, uh, one gets in the water. Sometimes it's made here on the front pew. But the confession is not that I'm confessing that I'm a sinner necessarily. I do that when I repent. Those are put together. But I confess with my mouth, as Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10 says, for with the heart one believes, what's this next word? Into or unto? Unto. If I'm going unto something, I'm not in it yet. So when I'm confessing Jesus is my Lord and Savior, guess what? I'm not married to him yet. I may be confessing that I want to get married to him, but I, and I want to be righteous, but when I confess and I believe that way, I am, I am coming unto Christ. With the mouth, confession is made. What's that next word? Is that unto or into? I can't confess into Christ. For that matter, I can't believe or repent into Christ unless I take the definition of belief as the totality of doing what God says do. You see? I am coming unto Christ when I confess, but nonetheless, as I'm coming, what my confession is, is that Jesus is Lord. And that's an important part in this great plan of salvation. Jesus is Lord. After the sinner makes the sinner's confession that Jesus is Lord, then we come to sinner's baptism. In John chapter 3, we have the account of uh, Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus. And Jesus said to him, I said to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Does anybody misunderstand that? What does it mean to be born again? How can a man be born, Nicodemus, in his misunderstanding, asks? 
Can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, most assuredly. You know, every time we see John 3.16 on a billboard or on television, and oh, every time I think, why can't John 3, 3 through 5 be put there with it? As we've said, we can't take one of this 12-step plan for recovery and exclude it from all others. Jesus answered, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water. Now obviously that's not what, and it's not really totally water at birth. That's not the point. That's what exactly Nicodemus' misunderstanding. That water is only one kind of water. It's water. Unless one is born of the water and the spirit. One birth, not two births. One birth, two elements. Be born of the water and of the authority or by the spirit or of the spirit, of the spirit's teaching, which we can't leave the spirit out of this teaching process or our conversion process. We're baptized into the Father, into the Son, and into the Holy Spirit, God. The God family. And if one does not do this, Jesus says he can't go to heaven. He can't get into the kingdom. In Acts chapter 22 and verse 16, as Saul of Tarsus is relating his conversion experience, he was told by Ananias, why are you waiting? Why are you praying? Why are you trying to pray a sinner's prayer? Why are you doing this? Get up, arise, and be baptized and wash away sins. Now, if my sins aren't washed away until I get to the water, how can I get to heaven? You see, that's the point. God is trying to relieve us by his love, by his grace, by his blood, by his word of our sins. And he says, if you're not born again, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven. And that's how you call on the name of the Lord. That's how you do it by the Lord's way, by his authority. And then the great apostle Paul, who was Saul, this same fellow, writes to the Roman church and he says, or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? Don't you know this? In other words, if you have not been baptized into Christ, you haven't been baptized into his death where the blood was flowing that cleanses sins. That's where you get it and nowhere else. Now, if people want to call this sermon overemphasizing one point, I don't know how else to say it. But I'm telling you this. If it wasn't for what we've already talked about in God's part of salvation, that baptistry might as well be as dry as a bone. But if God does say what he means... And he did what he say that he did. Then this water is just as important as anything else. And we can't, by calling on his name, suggest anything differently. So Paul says, therefore we were buried with him through baptism. If it wasn't through baptism, then we weren't buried with him. We weren't raised with him. But just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we also should what? When does the, we should walk in a new life. When does that new life begin? It doesn't begin in a prayer. It doesn't begin it when we repent. It doesn't begin when we confess that Jesus is Lord. No matter what religious people say, let God be true and every man a liar. And I wish we could have some more public discussion in this community about these points. And I wish that we could have some time to go through God's plan of salvation, not just what must I do to be saved, but to realize that what I'm doing to be saved is based on what God has done. But they're all important. But this is when we become married to Jesus Christ. When we are baptized into Christ, we become his bride. We become a part of his body. You see... When a man and woman come together, they're not supposed to come together till after they're married. But once they're married, they share that intimate relationship of being one. Right? Of being united together. This is when it happens. Not until. And that's why this is so vitally, vitally 
important. In Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 and 27, you are all the sons of God through faith. How, Paul? For as many of you as have been baptized, oh, what's this next word? Is this the word unto? Tell me. What into? That makes all the difference. You see, we believe and we repent and we confess unto Christ. There's only one, there's only one action in the Word of God that tells me how to get into Christ, and that's the thing that the religious world wants to ignore. I can't figure it out. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21, just as Noah and his family were separated from a sinful world by water in the ark. Guess what the antitype of Noah's water and Noah's ark is? The antitype. Well, let's read it, right? They were formerly disobedient when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight, souls were saved. What are those next two words? <laughs> oh, but water doesn't have anything to do with our salvation. Absolutely false. Just as Noah was saved through water, you and I are saved through water. There is also an antitype. What is that antitype which now saves us? Does baptism save you? Let's put, let's put two lines up here. Baptism does also now save us. Baptism does also now not save us. Read that verse and fill in that easy blank. All but works can't save us. That's not what James is going to say in just a moment. It's not taking a bath. It's not removing the filth of the flesh. It's removing the filth of the soul, of the spirit. And it gives us, guess what gives us the good feeling in the heart? Peter calls it a good conscience toward God. What gives us the good feeling in the heart? Any mention of a sinner's prayer? Any mention of uh, going, going and joining the church of your choice? Any mention of that? What gives the good feeling in the heart? It's knowing that my sins have been removed the way that God says do it. Buried with Christ. Buried with Christ, my Here's the third part of God's plan of salvation. We've looked at eight steps, four left. When one becomes a Christian, he's baptized into the body of Christ by the blood of Christ, by the grace of God, by the Father's love. Then the Christian must love as Christ's love. That's why the, the two most important commandments, to love God and to love one another. But notice the depth. We, we, we began by singing how deep the Father's love. Now, look how deep your love needs to be and my love needs to be. Matthew chapter 22 and verse 37. Jesus said to them, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. That means his way goes above our ways. That means when we are thinking about what we need to do to satisfy, satisfy the flesh, God's way comes first. Hopefully, we've repented of that thinking when we become a Christian. But you know what? We need to continually repent of that, even as a Christian. You shall love the Lord your God. Notice this. With all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your emotions. When we love somebody, we keep our emotions in check. Because if we do wake up on the wrong side of the bed and we're not in a good mood, we don't want to slap anybody. We don't want to get physical, do we? We keep those emotions in check. And when we love God with all of our mind, the emotions should follow. The good feeling, the emotional comes after loving God with all your mind. In 1 John chapter 3 and verse 11, this is the message that you heard from the beginning that we should love not this pseudo false love that the world talks about. You know, love that puts self first. I love this, I love this, I love this because it pleases the flesh. 
That's not the love we're talking about. But that we should love one another. What kind of love are we talking about? That even though it was the emotional setting that has ever been known to man, the Father allowed that crucifixion to go forward and Jesus kept himself on the cross when he could have called 10,000 angels. Now, how does my love compare to that? This is the Christian's love. And they'll know we are Christians by our love. Not by the good feeling we have in our hearts. They, they can't necessarily see that. They see love in action. They see faith in action. They see repentance in action. It doesn't stay in the mind. It begins in the mind, but it shows itself as God would want it to be shown. In 1 John chapter 3 and verse 13, notice this. We know that we have passed from death to life. How? Because we love each other. And when we do that, guess what results? We don't hightail and, and, and run somewhere else when, you know, our opinion is not granted. We know that we have gone from hell to heaven. That's what that death, that's spiritual death to life. That's not dealing with physical death and life. We know that you want the, you, do you want the confidence of salvation? Then let's love each other better. That's what that's saying. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother, to what degree? I will not insult your intelligence in answering that question. He abides in death. 1 John 4, 7, 8. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God. Here's, here's another phrase in the Bible that talks about, you know, the, the birth. The spiritual birth. We already went through that spiritual being born again. But guess what? You want to stay in that state? Then we need to love God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God. You might as well be an atheist is what he's saying. That's what he's saying. Doesn't know God. For God is love. So, Right? By this we know we love the children of God when we love and keep his commandments. That's what love is. Love keeps his commandments. See, that's not necessarily emotional. Emotion fl flows from it, but it's mental. It's spiritual. So, are not these the greatest commands? This song is uh, written for the altos to begin, uh, and then build after that as the verses go along. But we're, as you can see on the screen, we're going to start right in the middle of this song. So everyone, please uh, join in. Love one another for love is God. He who loves his own of God and loves God. He who does not love is love but not only in God's 12-step plan of recovery is love not essential part of that plan but also the Christian's work I don't know how often I've heard from from the religious world and even sometimes among my brother we're not saved by works that's not what James says look beginning in verse 14 14 of James 2 what is a prophet my brethren if someone say his faith but does not have works in other words, what is someone saying that he can be saved but not by works? Yeah, those works were the works of the law, works that we have originated, works of merit that Paul talks about in Ephesians. That's not the work that James is talking about. Can faith save him without those works? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled. But you do not do for them the things which are needful for the body. What is a prophet? 
Thus also faith by itself, it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works. I'll show you my faith by my works. Now again, the works that we do, are they inherent or do they originate salvation? Absolutely not. Ek argon. Salvation is not out of works. Salvation is ek, out of, theos, God. That's where salvation originates. But to say that our response or our action or our works have nothing to do with God's plan of salvation. Let's, now here's, the, here's another pendulum, Walter. Here's going from one extreme to another. We need to understand what James is saying here as he shows us his faith by his works. You believe that there's one God? Well, good. That's a good thing. But remember this, the demons believe in God. They believe he's the Lord and Savior. But what's the difference? The demons don't accept what he says. Maybe some of the demons are faith-only kind of people in the, in the common sense of that word. But do you want to know, oh, Someone that believes this, God calls them foolish. Oh, foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac on the altar? And the Lord didn't tell Abraham that he believed in the faith of Abraham until that faith acted, until he was bringing the knife down to kill his son. That's the degree that we're talking about. Do you see faith was working together with his works? And by works, faith was made perfect. And then the scripture was fulfilled, which said, Abraham believed God. When did Abraham believe God? When he did what God said. And that's all that the scripture teaches. And it's so clear. We need to be preaching and teaching this from the housetops. And it was accounted, notice, when Abraham was going to be saved by the blood of Jesus in prospect. It was accounted, put it on his account. When something is put on our account, it becomes significant later. Righteousness was accounted to Abraham when his faith acted, when it worked, when it believed. And he was called, wouldn't you like to go to judgment and hear the Lord say, you're my friend? You're not going to be able to say that you're his friend if you didn't teach his 12-step plan of recovery for salvation. He was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith. The insignificant, the less defined faith only. And so... Mark chapter 6, verses 15 and 16. He said to them, Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is saved can be baptized later to show that he's been saved. There might be someone in the audience that believed that religious teaching. You know, you need to change that today. You need to believe he that believes and is baptized then will be saved, not before. And he who does not even believe, if he's not going to believe, he's certainly not going to be baptized. He who does not believe will be condemned. That's not me. 2 Timothy chapter 2, 15, be diligent then to present yourselves approved to God. How do we do that? Just by doing what God has asked us to do. A worker who does not need to be ashamed. Notice this. Even those that don't complete this can still be considered a worker, but an, a worker that's ashamed. You don't have to be one that's ashamed. You can be one that rightly divides the word of truth, and that's what we're trying to do in this lesson. We're not taking one verse out of context. We're putting it all together. That's how we rightly divide the word of God. And so, we're not going to say we're not going to be saved by works. You know what we're going to say and sing? We'll work till Jesus comes. Oh,
Again, those works are not founded. It's not the fundamental part of our of salvation, but they're a growth from it. And if we say that teaching others the gospel, going the Great Commission is a work, are we going to be able to be saved if we don't tell anybody about the gospel? That's what our mission is. That's our primary work. So as a Christian, we see it's necessary in God's 12-step plan of recovery for a Christian to love, for a Christian to work, but also there's the Christian's hope. Romans chapter 8 and verse 24. We are saved in this hope. Listen, if you're not sure you're going to heaven today, you're not going. It's that clear and simple. Because our faith gets to the point where we are absolutely sure. Because if you're not sure you're going to go to heaven, I mean, are you going to teach somebody? Are you going to teach anybody to come to a, well, and this is not the uh, usual definition of hope. You know, biblical hope is desire plus expectation. The Bible calls it the anchor of the soul. We are saved in this hope. But hope that is not seen is not hope. See, some people require to believe something uh, before they believe it. Well, that's not the faith of the Bible. In faith of the faith of the Bible is not having seen. Abraham, when he was told to go into a far country, didn't know anything about it. But he knew God said go, so he's going to do it. But it's not like it wasn't based on any knowledge or any evidence. That's what faith is, right? Faith is the conviction of things not seen. And so I must have this hope because God places it in salvation. Hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? It's already been, it has already been seen. So, what's your hope built on? I hope it's built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. My hope is still last step in God's 12-step plan of recovery is Christian's endurance. The Christian's endurance. Matthew chapter 10 verse 22, you will be hated by uh, all for my name's sake. You feel like that in this world because you're living righteously? There are some great examples in this audience this morning who are suffering because they decided to stand with God. If you're living right, someone's going to hate you, not because of your sins, but because of your desire to live right. Because maybe you're teaching them the truth and they don't want to hear it. Maybe because you have stand in, you feel like you're standing alone in the realm of morality. And how you speak and how you dress and how you talk and how you do all of this. Maybe that's why some hate you. You'll be hated by all for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end will be saved. And now the one we know the best, Revelation 2.10, do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. John is writing from Patmos to the seven churches of Asia who are facing death. Indeed, the devil is about to throw you, some of you, into prison. Not all, literally. That you may be tested. That's why things come into our life. Our faith is not true until it's been tested. Whatever it is in your life as a Christian, you are being tested somehow, some way. 
And you'll have tri tribulation for a determined amount of time. Here, 10 days. Be faithful unto death and I'll give you the crown of life. Would anybody say that any of these 12 steps is not necessary to be saved? That's what they all have either directly stated or clearly implied. Be faithful unto death. So, if that's the case, can someone that's gone through these 11 steps lose his salvation? Can he fall from grace? Paul, Peter, John, answer that in the affirmative. But you don't have to. You see, these steps, many of them, none of us will have perfect love. None of us will have perfect hope. None of us will live a perfect life. But what a difference is that we can do it faithfully. It can be a part of our lives. And when we stumble, God is so willing to take us back. Even if we've wandered far away from God, Lord, I'm coming home. And we're going to sing a song here that talks about being faithful to the end. And immediately thereafter, we're going to sing an invitation song. And the name of that invitation song is, There's a Stranger at the door. And perhaps for many of you today, he is a stranger. If you have not gone through his 12-step recovery of saving man, a part of it is what must I do, but do you really believe that God has done what he has done? Do you believe in God's part? Have you done that which is necessary to become a Christian, but not only that, you could still be far away even once having been born again and being saved. Oh, you're still his child, but you could be a disinherited child. You know, that's the way it is in the physical realm, too. You know, once a child, always a child of the father, but sometimes they can be disinherited. And this can happen if we turn our back, not when we sin and stumble from time to time and hate it and get back up and go on our way, but that way of life is not characteristic of us. We repented of that, you see. But being faithful unto death, you can do it with the help of the Spirit of God and the spirits of everyone in this church. You can make it. We're going to make it. Will you come and endure to the end with us, never looking back, no turning back ever, and rely on that grace, great love and grace of God to usher us through so we can be with him forever and eternity. Come while we stand and sing these last two songs. <laughs>
Matt, I want to thank you for that, that message, that sermon. Jeremy, I want to thank you for leading our songs. But I think we can all say that we appreciate all of us here having edified and admonished each other in our songs today. It's been a powerful message through what was said and through what was sung. We thank you all. There are a number of us, of our family, who are suffering, and we need to remember those in our prayers and, and in what we do each day, praying either as a corporate body or individually in our homes and reaching out and touching those folks. There's a number that have, are suffering physically, spiritually. There's some who have lost loved ones. We need to remember them all. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Our gracious Lord, we come before you bringing glory, honor, and praise, and we come thanking you for the way you bless us and care for us. And Father, we come before you asking you to look down upon all of those that, that are dealing with, with pain, that are dealing with, with suffering, that are dealing with loss. We pray for them. We pray for your healing hand upon them, Father, and we pray for those caring for them. We pray for their families. We pray for those that are, are ministering to them, that they shall continue in that manner in a, in, in a way of strength and endurance. And Father, we, we ask you to be with us, guide us, help us always serve you in a way that is pleasing to you and that builds up your kingdom on this earth. Help us be the ambassadors for you here that you want us to be. Father, guide us, be with us, protect us, and keep us strong. Forgive us when we fail you, Lord. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We will not be.